Welcome, one and all. We're uh, getting underway now in our uh, next installment in Sefer Breshit Perak Yodalad. Uh, Avram Avinu tells the king of Stom he has no interest in taking not a thread and not a shoelace from him. Uh, and um, there are various ideas on various levels to understand what it means that this is what he told him. By which I mean to say that an individual could use the same sentence, the same language, and that language could refer specifically to uh, a turn of phrase. All right? We could debate this till the cows come home. We could, uh, you know, you think of so many, so many turns of phrase that are nothing more than turns of phrase. They, they don't have any inherent meaning. They, they just, there's things people say. In, in Australia, people sometimes at the end of a sentence uh, will actually use the expression, and Bob's your uncle. And it's not even clear what Bob's your uncle means. I just, sidebar, I actually came up, I, I'm, uh, I found in a, in a book about the, uh, the history of early 20th century England, why we got to Bob's your uncle, but never mind. The point is, when Avram Vinu said to, to uh, Melech Stom, uh, I won't take a thread. I won't take a shoelace from you. Uh, what's its inner meaning? He said, I, I don't want anything. I, I think the expression would be, I don't want a toothpick from you. It, that's what it meant. It is no, stop digging to figure out that there's some inherent meaning within it. And that's on the level of pshat. We have to realize when we're learning, the level of pshat has its own inherent significance and value. And that's, that's okay. This was a, uh, a, a big debate among the various Mepharsha HaMikra. This is how they try to understand their, what the words in Chazal mean, Divra Tark Lashon Bnei Adam, the Torah speaks in the language of human beings. So can there be elements within the statements of the greats, of the Avod and the Imahot, which are no more than turns of phrase, that's all it means. Um, of course, generally, uh, Chazal did not take uh, that kind of attitude, even though they do, we do declare the Torah speaks the language of human beings. That just means that the great gulf that is essentially unbridgeable between Hashem and human beings is somehow mysteriously bridged through the language of the Torah. It is the Dvar Hashem. It's a country who's communicating with human beings in human categories. All right? That's, we've gone through this many, many times. This is why there are anthropomorphic statements, which means there are statements that seem to ascribe Human characteristics to Hashem. But Hashem's not human. He's not given to the vagaries of anger and sadness or joy or whatever, whatever it, it is. But that's for our ability to have a relationship with a Kaddish Baruch. This is a great issue uh, in general, in relationship of us to a Kaddish Baruch. Hu. If one anthropomorphizes God too much and a uh, Kaddish Baruch Hu is no more than an extension of uh, an aggrandized human being, chas v'shalom, that's avodah zara. If God is made so ethereal, so abstract, so in the beyond, that there's no way to relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so uh, we've disconnected Hashem from the world. That's such a view that instead of imminence is such a transcendent view of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that it also will do violence. And it's farthest extreme, it's atheism. And so between those two polarities, the balance is the relationship that we have with HaKadosh Baruch Hu through, let's say, the Dvar Hashem, we're learning Torah. I raise all of this because of what I want to uh, study a little bit today, which on the face of it, you could say to me, I mean, really, he said a thread and he said a shoelace. He didn't have in mind anything that hadn't yet been uh, revealed to the world, i.e. other elements or aspects of, uh, of Torah or of mitzvah. Some of the commentators thought that the words chut and srochnal referred to armaments, that the chut, the chizkuni says, is some kind of a, uh, of, a, of a headdress that would be worn, and a srochnal was the strap on the shoe of the battle boots. So he meant from head to toe, I don't want anything from you. That's a very nice idea. It encompasses the totality of the body of Avram Avinu. Um, the idea that um, the tour uh, uh, has, that in fact, this, along lines of Chizkuni, he actually meant from, the reg from my rosh to my regal, I don't want anything. Some of the uh, 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 Rishonim thought that the word uh, chut uh, uh, was actually a reference to the holster 
that would be uh, where the sword would be held. And the stroke now is in fact how the armor is attached to shoes. Uh, and Avram Avinu is saying that these protective elements or even appurtenances to weapons are things he has no interest in whatsoever. He won't, he doesn't want to uh, want to go near them. Uh, and for the reason that is ex explicated, that uh, he, he actually is saying, I don't want anyone to say uh, uh, that you made me uh, wealthy in any way, uh, uh, shape, uh, or form. The Radak writes that the Chut V'ad uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, referencing what had happened in the battle past and objects from the past. But then when he says afterward, Mikol Asher Lach, if you look at uh, verse 23, chapter 14, verse 23, if I take anything from you, so the Radak says the chut and the strochna refer to the battle that was passed. Because shalach means I don't want to take anything from you in the future either, right? Uh, 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 now, now there, there's an idea that uh, uh, perhaps there was a concern Avram Vino had there would be some ongoing relationship between him and Melech Zdom. He does not want this. He wants to move on and move past it. That's what he's essentially announcing uh, in this. Um, the, uh, there are other uh, uh, ideas. Sadia Gaon, very early commentator, one of the Gaonim from the Gaonic period, writes that Avram was hinting in these words to the Tzomech, the Chai, and the Domain, the world of vegetation, of flora, the world of fauna, and the world of that which is inanimate. The Chut is uh, that which is, uh, comes from the world of vegetation. It includes anything that is grown from the ground, the Chut made of whatever it is, cotton, something like that. But it means, according to the Rina Sadigon, I don't want any produce from you. The stroch now is something made of leather. That's an animal product. He doesn't want that either. Mikol HaShelach means I don't want the gold, I don't want the silver. Don't give me anything that you have, not the precious gems. I don't want anything uh, from you uh, at all. Um, what we had left ourselves with, a little bit of a question last we learned, was, uh, I think it was Shelley's question, how is it that the same Avram Avinu who is unwilling to take uh, anything from King of Sodom, was willing to take things from the King of Egypt. Um, so among uh, uh, one of the sometimes listeners uh, and watchers of the Shir, uh, here and there, uh, is uh, a close friend of mine. He's one of the Rami Mishivat HaKotel, Rav Ari Menachem Kotler, lives in Eretz Yisrael, and uh, just made it back to Yerushalayim uh, yesterday after a long time uh, at stay-at-home order, and the yeshiva was not uh, able to convene other than virtually. So uh, we're friends. He happened to watch uh, this, uh, this shear last week. Uh, not live, but recorded. So uh, he sent me something that I want to share with you now, which is um, interesting, um, interesting for consideration. Uh, it's the thought of the Be'er Yosef, uh, Rav Yosef Misalan, Rav Yosef Zundu Misalan, uh, his concept of the distinction between why it is that when it came to the world of Paro, uh, Avram was willing to accept the gifts, and he had no qualms about that. And yet when it came to the world of Stom, Avram was extremely skittish about that. So I put this on your screen in front of you. I hope everyone can see it. This is from the, the parish of the Be'er Yosef. And we're not going to see the, uh, the, whole, the whole piece, just a little uh, piece of it, because this is the question right here of the Be'er Yosef. You can see on your screen, this is a question. Why didn't Avram give back the gifts from Paro, the marriage, quote unquote marriage, which was nothing more than the forcible taking of Avram Vinu's wife. Uh, and there were all these gifts that were given. Uh, in the end, uh, Paro gave uh, uh, Sarah back, Baruch Hashem, nothing happened. So what, what is this? How did he get uh, to keep all the gifts? So the answer of Rav Yosef Misalant is the following. He writes that basically the objects that Avram Vila received from Paro at a time, I will ad lib and say it was a time of famine. So at a time of famine, Everyone is engaged in a sense in, or of a great uncertainty. People get, gain a certain or take on a certain scarcity mentality. It's understandable. We don't know where our next meal is coming from. We don't know if our economic situation is about to be undermined. And therefore, it makes sense for us 
to want to uh, hold back being somehow magnanimous, generous, just giving gifts to others. But when Avram Avinu returns with Sarimenu from Mitzrayim, suddenly he's extremely wealthy. And therefore, showing that wealth to others and explaining the story becomes the symbol of Pirsim Hanes, publicizing the great miracle that otherwise would have been nothing more than a hidden miracle. The story is uh, uh, of not just the fact that, oh, we went down together and we came back up together, but that actually a plague hit Paro and his household on account of having taken Sarah. This thing was not, this matter was not known in the land of Canaan. And in his palace, in the capital city of Nobody knew this in Eretz Canaan, top of this call. Therefore, he brought them back. They showed God's, uh, an object that symbolized the demonstration of God's providence and God's ability. It was in order to be able to publicize the, 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 the knowledge of God in the land. Now, don't jump on me. Let's keep going and fill out the idea. When Avram Avinu went to Mitzrayim, he had stayed in all sorts of places. He had essentially been a vagabond before he went to Egypt. Remember, he stays in this place, he goes to that place. But when you read in Parshat Lach Lecha, at the beginning of the Parsha, you can go back to chapter 13, it says that he goes back to the same place he went to before. So the Ber Yosef expands that not just one place, but all the places where he had previously been. He goes back to each station. And when he goes back, and now he has all this wealth, he explains to them, do you understand how illogical it is that in a time of a famine, I should have more wealth? Let me tell you the most unbelievable story about how God has helped me. By the way, in that story of Avraham and Sarah going down to Mitzrayim, the only one that Hashem speaks to is, that we know of, not Avraham, not Sarah. Paro. Paro, exactly. What's amazing is that in that story, only Paro is hearing directly from Hashem, but everyone else understands that God is with them. And in their life story, come what may. And now Avram Venus says, you see all this wealth. This wealth is all from Hashem. And that's why it says, Avram kaved me'od mik nebekesu v'zav. He went to his, the Torah says, to his journeys, plural, means he stopped in each place. And then he went until he got to the original place from the beginning, Bechila, to the place of Mark Mizbech, and there he called the name of God. All this was all a prop in his story. And we find this, okay, I'll skip, 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 so not, not for now, but now let's go down to here, okay? So, uh, just to strengthen, uh, 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 to publicize the miracle, and to, uh, to be mechazek, the, uh, the emuna, so to, of, of others. Uh, that they should see how wondrous it is that at a time of famine and global crisis, he was wealthier, not poorer. Now, uh, let's keep going, because I want you to fill out, I want to fill out the piece. We're coming to the end of it here. So let's, let's see it. Ulam Eitzel Melech Zdon. Acharei Shnuchan Ba'arba HaMalachim Sheyu Giborim Sheyu Kuhet HaRefaim Vazuzim Vaimim Sheyu Kol Kach Giborim Adirim V'gam Nitzchot HaChamisha Malachim After Avram Avinu fought the four kings, and he also obviously vanquished the five kings, since they were conquered by the four, and Avram conquered the four, right? The five were conquered by the four, Avram conquered the four. So therefore, he also had the five under his control. He fought, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, with them, and he, 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 he won. And he brought everybody back. And through that war, his name was already well known, as we saw in the Medrash, that all the nations came to the Emek they want to make him the king. 
Chinglichud Avram. They want to somehow crown him, right, for, for this uh, purpose. Next page. Well, we want, they want to make him, right? We quoted this. We saw it in Raj. We saw it in the Medrash. The miracle was well known enough. They don't need something else, you know, to, to, to strengthen this by taking the objects. And therefore, Avram doesn't want these things because the publicity already came. The Pirsume Nisa happened. And therefore, he gave it back to King Stom. He said to him, I don't want anything. And that's why he said to him, that's why he said, we saw this really in another vein in the Master Chachma, that Avram Vina raised up his hand to Hashem, who is the supreme God, who is the creator of heaven and earth. Hainu, meaning, since I, Avram Avinu, as a result of this episode, this more than episode, this great event, that has now resulted in it, Hashem be, call, helping me to be victorious. I raise up my hand. We saw already from the Meshachach, my for raising of the hand of song, right? This is the song. So now he made the publicity speech. But the, the Bariosi says, now that I made the speech, the Koneshoim Baaretz, Vakosha, everything belongs to God. And I'm making mention in verse 22 God is supreme God who is the master of heaven and earth. So now, Everybody now recognizes this reality, this faith, um, and therefore I don't want any objects from you. They are not going to be helpful to me. Au contraire, now I'm ad libbing because you see the piece that Bar Yosef finished. There's the pro, there's the specter of a uh, of a revisionist historical uh, uh, narrative that will be spun by the king of Sodom, such as Avram, I made him. Avram, he fought so that he could become wealthy on my account, and I had to pay him. Avram, he was in it with his mercenaries for other ulterior motives, not really even necessarily including anything godly. What does Avram say? I'm not taking anything. It's all from Hashem. There are other historical uh, uh, um, uh, examples of this. They run a plenty, right? The whole idea of um, what happens as a case in point in Yericho is a good example, right? The Jewish people are not allowed to take any of, the, any of the spoils of war, but in the end, one of them does, and there's a crisis. We learned that together uh, in great depth uh, when we studied, say, for Yehoshua uh, um, a number of years ago. So there's, there's that, uh, that element uh, for consideration. Let me pause here and um, take some uh, questions and comments. And uh, please go ahead. Anyone who has uh, anything they'd like to add at this time, just unmute yourself, please. Isn't okay. Hanukkah, Purim, Hanukkah, the miracle takes place in in Eretz Yisrael. Purim, the it's it's hidden. The miracle is outside. They send out this letter. The send the letter doesn't even reference God. Not none of that. This is taking place in um in Egypt. The only time when these miracles, uh, when it's not hidden, is later on when we get out of Egypt. And that's mostly to get us out, not to proclaim God. It, it's to set us out as a nation, to get it's us famous. to Har Sinai. Yeah. So why would this miracle be so um, so publicized, the one in Egypt with Sora? It's, it's, not, it's not so not publicized. In it's not so publicized. The point is, it's only publicized because when, according to the Be'er Yosef, when Avram Vino returns back to Eretz Kenan, he incorporates the events that had happened to him as part of his story as a mommin of his life. And it becomes that which he tries to advertise. He's telling people, look at how uh, uh, this happened. Isn't it crazy that I should be more wealthy than ever before? As a result of going down to Egypt because there wasn't enough food. Yes, but it could be, but it could be put on. It could still be spun by people yes. who didn't want to believe in God ah. that this is because he pimped out his his wife, Sarah. Halila, 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 to speak in such a way. I know, I know, but, but, but I'm just you're looking right, at right, how you're, it you're, was. You're right. You're right. Especially the with Avi Melech later on, when it's going to be such pains are going to be taken midrashically that um yitzchak is abraham's son and that nothing like him. Happened. right right Inach inami. your point is well taken uh nothing is without its ability to have spin and speaking of uh spin uh you remember that avram avinu's 
the formative story in the Madrash Avon Vinu in the fiery furnace. He comes out of the fiery furnace. That's the, we learned this ages ago. That's the Ramban saying it was a, a, a huge nace, a big miracle, whether literally he walked out of a fiery kiln or whether it's a nace nista that he got out of prison and no one ever got out of the dungeon there. But in either, in either case, the people in Ur Kasdim didn't react by saying, Hashem Hu Elohim. They reacted by saying, stay away from this man. He is some kind of crazy necromancer. Get him out of here. In either case, they weren't won over. Because in the end, you could tell the best story, have the best proofs, and et cetera, et cetera. You still need the people to agree. The faith will not be compelled. And Avram Avinu, right here, what's interesting is, and I'll, I'll end with this point, and I'll take some, some, someone else's question as well. I was waiting, hold on one second, is that we had learned previously that when Avram Avinu was going to save Lot, there was this story about how the king of Stom uh, was coming out of some kind of mud pits and Rashi there, quoting the Medrash, who is Rashi? The Medrash, quoted, I think by Rashi, has this strange idea that something miraculous was happening to the king of Sodom that was retroactively authenticating the story of Avon Vino having been saved from the, the, um, from the, the fiery kiln, from the, the, uh, the kiln in, uh, in Ur Kasdim. If you look at verse 10, and you look at Rashi there, this is some, this, he quotes the Medrash, that there was some kind of, a mortar that or like these pits, mud pits, like quicksand. And uh, there was a ki the king of Stom had a miracle. He came out. So the, there were some of the nations of the world that didn't, uh, they didn't believe that Avvidu was really saved in Ur Kasdim from a fiery kiln. So there from a kiln, therefore from the Kibshana Aish. And now when they saw that on account of Avvidu passing by, the king of Stom came up. Now they believe that Avram Avinu was really Avram Avinu, that that previous miracle was real. What's that about? They're still thinking about something that happened. They're not even in their country. So we tried. To, I tried to explain that it's like closing a circle here. Am Rafael, Amar Paul Nimrod, who was the main denier of the way of life of Avon Vino, and Avon Vino, the main denier of his way of life, now had come to wreak vengeance against Avon Vino and his family, had passed through Stom, picked up Lot, had this happen. But by the by, retroactively, people would say, oh, it's really what happened. Avon Vino was claiming all this time. Now we saw with our own eyes that kind of salvation happening to someone else, and now it's on account of Avram Vinu. Now we believe in that story. But what's amazing is, and that's exactly to your point, Sean, and then I'll move to someone else over here, so I'm gonna give other people an opportunity as well. I don't want us to monopolize, but is the idea that now also there's gonna be a story with the Chut Rad Srochna. Avram is very nervous, uh, not very nervous. He's concerned that the king of Storm shouldn't turn around and say, Avram, he's a warrior, great guy. I hired him, I paid him, I own him, I made him, I inform him, you know, and make him who he is. That's what Avinu is worried about, because you're right, after all is said and done, the narrative can still be spun. And that has tremendous consequences, sometimes uh, disastrous consequences, uh, as we know from Chaita Maraglim or any of those other many, many myriad stories in Tanakh that are, that are like that. Uh, someone else was waiting, I don't know who it is, but they uh, stirred and I don't want to- <laughs> Hi, Helen. Good morning. Oh, I, I take Sroch Na'al as a very important legal cautionary thing in my life. I had a, a situation where a friend of mine died, and the lawyer had power of attorney, and he says, go take anything that you want from the estate. But I know the man had a sister in Israel who was sick, even though she could not be reached. I realized this was not my place to take Sroch Na'al because this was her Yerusha. And anything, even though he had power attorney, it would have sticky fingers and not be right. And I always think about that whenever there's an exchange, remember Ad Sroch Na'al. And it's become a personal thing for me. Wow. A personal application of a Pasuk that probably most of us have read year in, year out, and shrugged our shoulders and said, all right, you don't want shoelaces. All right, you don't want anything. All right, fine. But uh, wow, that's amazing. That's great. Thank you for that. And it does, it does tell us about this sort of this law of unintended consequences or the prospect that someone could spin uh, something that maybe legally is coming to us, uh, but, uh, but we're still, um, you know, we're, we have to, we have to be, be mindful uh, of the reality of, uh, of how it could, um, how it could. Uh, and one other thing, yeah. it also pervades to Hashavas Aveda, how careful 
you have to be to see that something is free and clear without any ID that you may take it. So it even spills over into that. Good, 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 good. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rabbi? Yeah, Hi, please. Karen. Uh, oh, somebody else talking? Yeah. Oh, okay, it's Karen. And I was just thinking of a modern day example, namely the um, stimulus checks and how you think of that money, whether that's really free and clear money or are they buying my vote kind of money? And do you want to keep it? Do you want to take it? What do you do with it? Yeah. So is the, the lesson is a life lesson for us even now. Great, great. Rabbi, what yeah. about the fact that Lot lives in Sodom and that if um, Abraham uh, offends the king of Sodom, it could have repercussions on Lot. And obviously he cares about Lot because he's going to war for him. So if we want to recast the Melech Sodom as a mafia dawn, then he is saying to Abraham, please take my gift. It's a token of my appreciation. And Abraham saying, yeah. The King Stone says, no, no, you really should take it. But in the end, Avram does not take it. Uh, that's, that's, that's how but it is. But is, is the, um, what would you call it, the nicety, the, maybe the appeasement to the King of Sodom, the fact that the men who accompany him can take something, so that's sort of the compromise, appeases the king. Um, but of course, that can be spun. See, I did buy him. <laughs> he didn't need he didn't need my money, but I'm paying his uh, I'm paying the people that came with him. So there was a distinction that he wanted to make. We'll come to that in a minute. I want to see one more thing with the with the thread and the shoelace, but hold that thought, and then we're going to come to the part about the B, you know B, B la, you know the uh, the part says bila die raka shirachlane arim. So hold on one minute, but let let's look at one other piece here, which is I'm putting on the screen. This is again the Meshach Chachma. I just thought that what he had to say on this section was um, was really was really interesting and compelling. The the Medrash understands the words from a thread until a shoelace as a reference and a hint um, to different mitzvot. And the idea of the Medrash, I didn't give you the Medrash, but the Medrash basically says this thread is the thread of the threat. Thread, excuse me. Amar Rav Abba Bar Memel says Medrash Raba. Hakadosh Baruch Hu says Imamarta in Michut. Chayach Hashinotim Levanecha Mitzvat Tzitzit. I'll get the mitzvah of Tzitzit. And what is Stroch Nal? And Stroch Nal from the strap of the shoe, you're going to get the mitzvah of Chalitza. It's beautiful, but when you hit, think about it, say like seriously, because Avram used a turn of phrase. Okay, but if we understand Avram Avinu, or at least the words that are recorded from Avinu. You know, Avinu said many things in his life. What's recorded? Stam is turns of phrase. So there, that's where we understand there's a deeper, there are deeper levels of what's transpiring. So on the level of Pshat, it could have been a turn of phrase. But on the level of Medrash, the level of Chazal, we understand that there may be traditions that there's a, a, a hyperlink here. There's something glowing in these words. It's reminding us of something that's more significant. So here's the Meshachach, I want to show you this for two reasons. First of all, what the Meshachach tends to do, I don't make this a study Meshachach, he spent a whole year studying Meshachach, but he, he basically quotes this section, <laughs> I'm going to give you the mitzvah of Yibum, quoting from the Madrash, she takes off his shoe. You recall how uh, Yibum and Chalitza works if uh, there's a couple and the couple is childless, God forbid, and the wife, the husband rather, dies before they have children, but the husband has a brother, then there's a mitzvah that the wife uh, uh, now marries her brother-in-law. If she does not want to, then they do the ceremony of chalitza. And the point is that, uh, 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 that, that the brother of the deceased, will be making zera le'achiv, he will be able to uh, raise the progeny and the seed of the, of the brother who was not, uh, uh, did not merit to have children before he died. So, uh, that's just interesting for its own uh, reasons related to Avram Avinu. In general, when you think about Avram Avinu and uh, um, uh, the concepts, not Yibum, but some variation, you know, Avram Avinu is certainly 
uh, what's going to happen later with Avram and Sarah. And the fact, they don't have children at this time. So it's interesting. And you have to think a little bit more, why is it actually connected to you know, King of Sodom? But look at, but, and maybe Lot, you know, and, and the fact that Haran died, and you know, they took the care of Lot. Is it related? I'm not sure. The Meshachachma writes, Mikan Remez Lamashon Rebbe Yushai Perak, Mitzvah Chalitza, Iker Chalitza, Atar Haratzuot. The main part of the Chalitza is that uh, the undoing of the, of the shoelaces, of the straps on the shoe uh, that, uh, that uh, she's taking off of his shoe. So where in the Torah anywhere does it mention straps from a shoe that the Yushami should say the main part of the mitzvah is in fact from the removal or the opening of the strap. From this pasuk, a pasuk in Sefer Breshit, not a legislative section of the, of the Torah, we learn a remez, a hint, that that's, this is its headquarters. Shami says it's not correct. Uh, there is, there, there, there is no, no, no remez to the Ritzur. But here, um, excuse me, originally the Rosh wrote, there is no hint to the Ritzur, but the Meshach Chachma comes to say, yes, there is, Srochnal is the strap of the shoe. Okay, and he says, and he says, and Seder Chalitza, that's apparently the Brach of Eichan Iskar Chok, Mitzvah, Eitzel Avram Bakra, wherever mention the notion of a mitzvah and a chok with regard to Avram Avinu, that you should say such a blessing, the edicts of Avram Avinu. When it comes to the mitzvah chalitza, it's a strange formulation. So the Meshachach says that's kind of partial told that Akev, Asher Shem Avram Bakoli, Vishmur Yishmarti Chukutai, Mitzvotai Torotai, Zerni Maz Bimilat Akev. The word Akev means a heel, not just on account of the fact that Avram hearkened to my voice guarded my, my, uh, my, that which needed to be guarded, my edicts, my mitzvot, and my Torah, but the word ekev is used. Ekev means not, it's a double entendre, not just on account of, but my heel. Shehu manul shel chalitza shel akevo shel adam, because the shoe goes on the heel. This is the message. Why isn't that a reference to Yaakov? Because Yaakov's name Yeah, Yaakov is the ekev, yeah, but not here. Parsha told that Yaakov isn't born yet, I won't go down that road. He's applying the word ekev here to refer to the midst of chalitza, to show that even such a mitzvah as chalitza is related somehow to the days and the time of Avram Avinu. Now the Meshach Chachma then quotes, this is really, really why I gave you, why I gave you this is because of this last little, little, uh, little piece, um, which is the Gemara and Masechet Chulin he quotes here. Look at this, um, unbelievable. It's just a very beautiful idea. It's a chidush of the Meshach Chachma based on the Gemara. He says that in Masechet Chulin it notes Although he vary, he varies it a little bit, but since he said, I don't want either a thread nor a strap for a shoe, but a strap. His children got two mitzvot. That's the thread of the azure that goes on the tzitzit. The other leather, the leather of the strap of tefillin. And it's possible. The Gemara tells us that Avram Vinu was metak and he established shacharit. Call you saw the men at least. It could be the Jewish people are going to uh, wear their tefillin and wrap in a talit during the prayer of shacharit as a memorial, remembrance of Avram saying to Melech Stom, "Imichut ve'ad now." This is just a beautiful, beautiful uh, drasha, which gives us a little window. Now, according to the commentary that I have on the Meshach Chachma, which is a magisterial work in its own right, he writes in the footnote that what the Meshach Chachma was trying to answer for here is the question of if there is a mitzvah to put on tefillin for a man to do every day and to wrap in the talit, why are these two mitzvot uh, a mitzvot for shacharit, uh, uh, um, and, and these mitzvot really should be for the entire day. Uh, and we have various reasons why we don't wear the tefillin and the talit all day. That then, if that's true, why shacharit? Why not put them on sometime during the day? You know, it's like a mitzvah anytime. Why is it associated with the prayer of Avon Vinu? Lulamed writes Rabbi Cooperman, maybe it is in the merit actually of Avram Avinu that we have these two mitzvot at that time of the day during the tefillah of Shachrit, named for or 
named by, dubbed by Avram Avinu. The prayer of Avram Avinu is the prayer of Shachari. So it's a very, very nice idea. Uh, although the, the, um, the even though Nasuchal quoted this, this Gemara, the truth is the Gemara is a little bit different in terms of the drasha that the Gemara itself makes. But this is part of the creativity, I guess, the Meshachachma. It's a very beautiful idea. And also, by the way, what is accomplished by this whole commentary? You thought when you started this year that everybody has their turns of phrase that they like to say. So Avon Vino is also a human being. He has turns of phrase. Don't make anything else out of it. No, but you read this Meshachachma and you see what Chazal are doing. You appreciate it's hard to stomach the concept that Avram Avinu was just a person who just said, I don't want a thread or a shoelace from thee. He could have said, no, thank you. The exact choice of terminology by an Avram Avinu, and one which is more recorded as the Dvar Hashem, means that even in this, there is a message. There's some lesson. And here, just to give you some of these examples, again, if we had more time and more inclination, we start parsing more and more I don't know how far we would get, but you know, why chalitza, why yibum, but I want to move on a little bit, so you'll indulge me. We're, we're picking up stakes, moving at least one pasuk ahead. And that is uh, here, Biladai, Rak Asher Achla, Na'arim, Bechelik, Anashim, verse 24, just what the, the, the lads, which means really Rashi says, the servants, what they ate. Bechelik, Anashim, Asher, Choiti, Aner, Eshkolom, Amrim, Heim, Minklu, Chalkam. Recall in antiquity, you bring your own food to war. You're not given the food. There's no mess hall. Yeah, the people aren't all eating together. You bring whatever you bring. You have the supplies that you have. Bring all your weapons as well. It's not government issue. So uh, Avavina mentions two things. The people who are subordinate to him, but also the people who are, the people who are with him. Aner Eshkol Umamre. Singled out. All of them. So if you look at Rashi, Rashi, verse 24, and Arim, Avadai Eshel Chuiti, my servants who came with me. But further, Ve'od Anar Eshkol Mamre, Afal Pisha Avadai Nichim Sula Milchama, even though my servants are the ones who actually went into the battlefield. Nonetheless, Shenem Arhuva Avadav, Vayakem, he and his servants, the Torah says, verse 15 over here. Vaner Vachavar Yashvil Akeim Lishmor, they were in charge of being the, uh, in charge of taking care of the, the, the implements, the tools, the vessels, etc. They get what they want. Umimenu lamad David. David learned from Avram Avinu. Sheamar kichelik yirud b'melchamu kichelik yirshiv al kelim yachdav yachaloku. Those who have gone out to war, remember this. This was only a number of, okay, maybe it was over a year ago, but we learned this together not too long ago. Many of us on this call. This is our Thursday shear. We're in Shmuel Bet now, but we're in Shmuel Aleph. There was the four hundred and the two hundred and the four hundred went to war and the two hundred sat with the kelim. Uh, with the vessels. It was a war against the Malik at the end of Sefer Shmuel Aleph. And indeed, David says that the same amount that will go to those who fought should go to those who sat with the, with the, with the Caleb. That neither group should claim we did more and therefore we get more. From that day forward, David made that the rule. He said from that day and onward, Vamala, that it was going to be the, um, the, uh, the edict and the statute, but it didn't say Vahala and only from this, uh, from this uh, moment as if it was made new now. Why? Because David got it from who? From Avram Avinu. Again, what do you see here? Very obvious. David Amalek had his heroes. David Amalek had his models. David Amalek was engaged in Avot Siman Labanim, but here not in the sense that we sometimes interpret it. We saw this in the Ramban, the beginning of Parshat Lach Lecha. Everything that the parents do is a signpost to the children in some kind of a way of predestined. It's fate, but rather that the children look back to the actions and the moral uh, uh, in, uh, um, conduct of the forefathers who become their role models even posthumously, even separated by many generations. David HaMelech learned Chumash. He learned Par- Sefer Breshit. He read Parsha the Shavua, whatever you want to say. So when he went to the battlefield, he thought to himself, how much should I give these and how much should I give those? Equal. Who taught me that? Avram Avinu. And that's an important lesson. And again, it raises this moment from simply being a moment that 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to take anything from you. Wouldn't that have been much more dramatic? By the way, guess who has to get paid? But we're learning a lesson from it and a moral lesson about the conduct of war and its denouement, but also fair treatment. By the by, in antiquity, for sure, um, uh, the, the, I don't want to say for sure. My, my supposition is more people wanted to be engaged in the gallantry and the honor, the chivalry of being on the battlefield and fewer people were actually inclined to sit in the back area. It was not necessarily cowardly, but you're not getting any great points for basically being a custodian of, of, of objects, right? So more people want to be on the battlefield. But for the sacrifice of sitting, staying back, you're not going to get less. Or rather, for going out to the battlefield, you're not going to get more. Understand? It's an equalizing feature, Davka, to, to, to keep the army together. Otherwise, there are striations within the military structure. Um, okay. And more to say about these, these, these people, Anur Eshkel and Mamre. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the Radak, by the way, disagreed with Rashi. He thinks that these people, Asher Okhuiti, means they went out to actually fight. They fought in the war. But these three people, Anur Eshkel and Mamre, we know are going to be important later on. They're going to be the Bali breed Avraham. We're going to come to them again uh, later. And then uh, uh, Avram living and dwelling in Elo named Mamre, the plains of Mamre. These are his friends. These are his, his people. And um, uh, they will be uh, also important further along. So I won't belabor the point now. We've hit the 10 o'clock uh, marker. I know you, many of you have another shear to go to. So uh, anyone um, closing comments or anything? We wanna, I have to, uh, we have to close now. Yes. Please, Helen, go yes, ahead. Yeah, but I, I have another crazy thing. It's not you crazy. Said magic, I love hearing what you have to you, say. Go. You, you oh. said the magic word. He could have said no thank you. When, when saying what he said is a little bit of a chutzpah thing to the other party. Uh, it's a smack of self-righteousness. And I'm just wondering, because I have an opposite quick story, a birthday party now going round and round with the cars, and one lady gives this lady, the birthday lady, a chicken. It was not up to the machmir standards of the lady, of the birthday lady. So she calls up and she says, I cannot use your chicken. I have higher standards of kashras and gives her back the chicken, which was very chutzpanik. Yes. So you have to be careful. The other side of saying, it, it has to be diplomatic also. Okay, but I don't, I, I, I'm not sure I see your point, how this has anything to do with Avon Vina being self-righteous. He simply said to the king of Stom, I'm not going to take your gifts. Here's why. But there are people who are with me who I don't have to impose my personal self-abnegation that I denied myself the spoils of war that were my due. I deny them. I don't want them. But on my back, someone else also has to be so machmir. So I'm going to, I want them to get paid what they have to get paid. Oh, okay. That's all. Anyway, we're okay. after 10 o'clock. Yeah. Sally, you want to say something in closing? Yeah. Um, Rabbi, what? Somewhere in the Torah, it's got stuff about the laws of war as far as whether the invading army can can take food from people. Yeah. And stuff. So what is it? I can't remember it. It's so in Devarian chapter, Devarian chapter 20. Too much. Okay. We don't have time to parse that now. That's it. You're opening a whole other, you know, realm over here with um halakha. Okay, but wouldn't that have something to do with with whether with feeding, giving me money so that I can feed the people that came with me? Sure. Is, is that for it or against? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's 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 true. That's true. That the, the the army gets to take what it needs for food. It's that that's true. But okay, but that that's that's part. That was part of war always, always and forever. But we have as as Jews in the Torah, there are always laws of wars. We saw that. Yes, yes. We learned with it the, with the women. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That's correct. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today. We'll resume again next week. Please feel free to join this week, Tuesday morning, tomorrow, 9 o'clock is Soul of the Sitter. Uh, Rabbi Sprung's uh, uh, Women's Gemara Shear Tuesday night. I have a Gemara Shear tonight, but it's sort of involved already, so if you're not already in it, it's a little complicated to just jump in, I admit. Uh, Wednesday, Short, Sweet, and Deep with Rabbi Sprung. Wednesday night, our Night Lights program, watching another little video and having about a 30-minute conversation. Thursday night, uh, then RZC and uh, RZA and OU and YU and RCA, doing a big program for young uh, Yerushalayim. You'll see that coming up. And then Friday, right before Shabbat, 
We're going to do a Shirei Yerushalayim Be'erev Shabbat, some singing together in honor of Yom Cheirut uh, Yerushalayim, and I hope you'll join us uh, for that. That is all we have time for today. So have a great day.